grace. We're so excited to worship with you. Let's just stand right now as we join in worship. There is joy in the house of the Lord, the fullness of joy. I just wanna encourage you, if you're not feeling joyful today, if you're not feeling that sense of fulfillment, you can just trust God that you are in the right place because there is joy in one name, the name of Jesus. He is working even when we don't see it. Just give it praise. We worship the God who loves. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors and parted the raging sea. My God. Church, let's sing. Come on. People come together, strangers, neighbors, our blood is one. The children, no generations of every nation of kingdom come. We sing. Don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high. Don't fear no evil. Fix 
your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. Take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where hell comes from. say, God, we trust you and you alone. Our attention and our affections are towards you. Let's sing together. Come on. Swing wide, oh you heavens. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. Oh creation, everything will forever repeat the sound. All this too. your voice come on and declare sweet wine all you hear
What a joy to be gathered together, amen? To know, and no matter what that we're facing Monday through Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, man, pain, trial, stuff happens. But guys, that's why we're gathering today. We're gathering to remember the one who gives us life and life to the full, and his name is Jesus. And I don't know where you're at this morning, but you need to hear your friends and your brothers and sisters to declare to you, hold on, stay strong. God is with you and God is for you. Is that not good news this morning, church? Yes, yeah, so may we live into those truths. May we live into those truths that his kingdom is here and that we get to participate. What a gift, what a gift to join. And so church this morning, as we continue to the worship, we wanna say, Spirit, we want more of you. Would you fall afresh on us? We wanna hear your voice. We know you, we trust you, we love you, but we're asking for more. So lead us, church, let's continue to worship as we sing.
Amen. You guys can grab a seat. Thank you so much for joining us this morning at Vintage Grace. My name is Michael, one of the pastors here. And if you are new with us, we are so glad that you're here. We also want to welcome our church joining us out in Mount Shasta today. Can we welcome them? And God is on the move, and I love that song that we just sang about the grace and the mercy of God, that that's something that gets to define us as the people of God. Guys, thank you again for being here. If you're new, we would love to connect. We want you to be a part of what God is doing, and we want to see God move through you as a part of this church. So if you're new, please fill out the Connect card, turn it into the Connect card in the lobby. Yes, I know I say this every week, but it's because we want to get to know you, and that's the easiest way to start getting connected here at Vintage Grace. Also today is uh, unique because we have a good friend of ours with us, Matt Moore, is gonna be preaching, if you guys could welcome him. 
Yeah, so Matt Moore has been, uh, man, I've known you almost 10 years now. This is great. And so Matt, uh, he helped plant Hope Church in Sacramento, who is one of our first church plant partners and uh, is a part of One Church, which is the church down there that we support in uh, Sacramento. And Matt is an incredible pastor, uh, loves the Lord, great communicator. And today he's going to be preaching from God's word to you guys today. He also supports um, our denomination of like-minded churches. And so we're just really excited to have him with us. Also, Christmas is upon us. I know, some of you are like, "Uh uh-uh, it is not time for my Christmas carols yet. Some of you, you turned them on Halloween, all right? And that's okay, because God loves you, all right? Now, if Starbucks has already flipped the script and everything is red and green, we thought we'd catch up with those people, okay? So we have something special for you today. We've got a video straight from Drew with all the details of what's happening this Christmas season. Check out the screen, and uh, Matt will be with you guys in just a moment. Hey, Vintage family, everything we do around here has always been and always will be focused on us personally and corporately living as disciples and disciple makers who are focused on the three great relationships of our one going deeper with God, of our two living life-changing relationships with each other, and then finally our three being sent as everyday missionaries to the places that we live, work, and play. Now, I can't believe it, but we are quickly approaching the Christmas season. And so we wanted to let you in on all the details of how we're hoping corporately to partner together as a communitas, a community who's truly sent to live on mission together as the living proof of our loving God this Christmas season. For me, Christmas season always comes way too fast and is over before we know it. Now, all that being said, we do recognize that Christmas is an unparalleled time when people are more curious about Jesus than usual. And so we want to do our best to partner with you to reach people with the gospel and point them to Christ. So I just want to take a moment right now to pause as a church family, a little huddle time so we can do a couple things, two things. First, pull out your calendar and literally plan to redeem the season well. If we don't plan well, we'll miss it. And number two, we also want to be praying because we believe that prayer is the work for kingdom movement to us and through each of us. All right, so starting in the month of November, we're going to be working with our church plant partner in Oakland, New City Church, to supply gifts for their discounted toy store. This gives us an amazing opportunity to love on a community, to help a church and our family of churches make an impact in their city, and personally to practice the generosity of Jesus. Now we've actually done this for a few years and the impact in Oakland has been huge. You can scan the QR code, which links to an Amazon wish list, and we get to send them a gift so they can be the everyday missionaries at New City Church there in Oakland. The wish list will run from November 5th to November 30th, and that gives us time to get the gifts to their team down there, as well as ultimately get the gifts to the community as well. Secondly, as we pivot to December, there will be regular chances for you to be the living proof of our love and God even closer to home, starting with our kids. When Vintage Grace Placerville started gathering, the kids from the apartment complex around the church would come up to the fence line interested and excited for what was happening in kids' ministry. They wanted to join in. As a result of this budding relationship, our amazing kids team had this idea to set up a toy shop here in El Dorado Hills where vintage kids would have the opportunity to buy a gift for their parents that Christmas season. And then we as a church will in turn give a gift for every item purchased. I love a good Christmas deal, right? Like a BOGO. This is a buy one gift one. So every gift that gets bought here will lead to a gift that will be given to people up there. And so EDH, that'll be happening on December 3rd, where our kids can shop between services. December 3rd is also our kids' Christmas song performance, so you definitely don't want to miss that Sunday. The next Sunday, December 10th, we'll be giving all the adults a chance to be the living proof of a loving God in your neighborhood. Now, I don't want to ruin the surprise for you, but Sunday, you will receive a gift to give to someone else on your prayer watch list, a neighbor, coworker, friend, someone that you want to continue to build your relationship with, with the hope that God would use you to point them to the joy that you have in Jesus. These are not gifts to give to invite someone to church, but rather to invite them into a deeper relationship with you, with the hope that they would see Jesus during this Christmas season. The next Sunday on December 17th, we're gonna have our all church family Christmas party. The theme is Merry Brunchmas. We're gonna have a hot brunch, family photos, a cocoa bar. It's gonna be a great time to get together as a community and celebrate the family of God that we get to be a part of. All right, I know that was a lot for the Sunday rundowns there in December, but these are great opportunities to live our cube personally. We don't ever wanna forget that our cube starts with our one for a reason. So at the end of November, we're gonna have free family devotionals that we purchased that you can pick up at the Connect Cart that'll help you start every morning going vertical as a son or daughter of the King. 
Our teaching team also has an incredibly special service and series plan called The Joy of Christmas, Gifts for a King. It's going to be awesome. We're going to slow down and huddle every Sunday to go vertical before we're sent out personally and corporately to live on mission as Sundays drive us and send us to Mondays. Also happening this December will be that Christmas mini golf is coming back, but with a twist. This year, we're transforming the room downstairs into a winter wonderland. We're gonna have tea time starting December 1st, and it's gonna be open the first three weekends in December, as well as the weekend after Christmas too. There's gonna be fire pits, conversation areas created and set up outside to really help you continue to build those relationships with the yet to believe friends. So invite your friends, sign up, grab a tea time at christmasminigolf.com. Finally, we really wanna give you a heads up as we prepare all of this building towards our Christmas service times. Christmas Eve services will start on Friday, December 22nd at 5 p.m. Saturday, three options at 1, 3, and 5. And then finally, Sunday, starting at 11 a.m., 1 p.m., 3, and 5 p.m. Now, you may be wondering, why are there so many services? It's because we want you to have plenty of space and opportunities to invite your Pray Watch friends to come hear the gospel. Christmas is a unique time of the year where people don't regularly go to church will come if only we would invite and share the good news and the joy that we have in Jesus. So multiple options gives your friends multiple opportunities to say yes. In fact, we've had some vintage family that have invited multiple friends and they come on Friday and others on Sunday. It doesn't matter when you come, it's just that you're inviting and bringing someone with you. And we wanna remove any barriers to them hearing the gospel. And so more options give more opportunities. Sincerely, church, we don't want all of this to just be white noise and busyness in an already busy season. What we wanna do is we wanna engage this Christmas. This video is gonna be online later, you can rewatch it. We've got a Christmas website that allows you to come back and get the core details to whatever you might've missed here. And more details are coming. And like I said before, this time of the year is unique. It's an opportunity for us to make much of Jesus, to engage with the yet to believe, and to enjoy all that God is reminding us of who he is and what he's up to. Let me pray for us. Spirit of God, as you've led us earlier this spring to not neglect the day of small things, we wanna pause, we wanna pray, we wanna ask you to do what only you can, to make dead people alive again. We thank you for the joy that you've given us. Would you lead us? Would you open our eyes to see what's around us? And would you make much of yourself through us? We pray that people who don't yet know you would come to know you as a result of us pointing people to you this season. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving and leading us. Amen. Sorry, that was me. Good morning, how are you guys? Good, good, good. So it was about eight years ago that I was in a little uh, a church plant assessment and your pastor, Drew, was there at the table with me. <clears throat> and uh, we, my wife and I, we moved from LA up to Sacramento to plant. And after the assessment, they gave us the green light and Drew um, took me out afterwards and he's like, I'd love to coach you. I'd love to build a relationship with you. And since then, our friendship and our love for one another has blossomed. Um, I would say that he's one of the main encouragers in my life. Even this morning, like at an ungodly hour, about 5 a.m., he texts me. He's like, I'm praying for you. Point him to Jesus. And so um, I love what God's doing here. I love the staff. I know some of you as well. Um, we have experienced um, the joy of the partnership with you guys. Um, even though we're 30 minutes away, um, some of you guys have come down, some of you guys have texted, some of you guys have served, some of you guys have given, so thank you guys for all the different ways in which you've partnered with us. So, uh, we just sang, right? What, what do you guys do when you sing? I didn't peek, well, I did a bit, but I know some of you, hands up, right? Some of you, eyes closed, some of you are just like, standing, staring, just waiting for it to be over, okay? Um, singing is uh, special, and for me, sometimes I'm not into it, sometimes I am, sometimes I just love blasting the radio in my car, and um, sometimes, like even my kids, will be listening to a song and we're into it, and I embarrass my daughter who's 12 sometimes because like I'm singing, she's like, Dad, stop. But then sometimes there's a song that comes on and we're all into it and then I hear a word, I'm like, nope, changing it. And they're like, what are you doing? I'm like, it's, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna listen to that. I don't like what they're saying. And they're like, but it's the beat, it's so good. And so, I don't know, today, I love the beat, I love the lyrics. Did you guys hear the lyrics that we were singing? 
there was this theme of grace, and I was taking notes. We, because of grace, we were beggars, now we're royalty. We were prisoners, now we're running free. We're redeemed, forgiven by grace. We're, Jesus is our redemption, our salvation. Clean hands, pure heart, good grace, good God. The weight is falling, we're rich, his rich mercy. Oh, how he loves me. We've traded our chains for forgiveness. We've been lifted from death, risen with him. There's so much truth in what we sing, and I don't know if at times when I sing, sometimes a piece, a word, a phrase, a a, a verse, a chorus, a bridge just kind of hits me and it awakens me because we're all coming from different spots, distracted, discouraged, maybe we're encouraged, maybe we're depressed, anxious, but then worship often just begins to take all those distractions away and focus us on, on him, and today, it was all about grace, and what I'm gonna be talking to you today about is grace. It's part of your name, right? Vintage grace. Have you thought about what that means, vintage grace? How many of you guys like wine? Can't raise your hand in church, that was a test. Vintage <laughs> wine, right? So a couple, a couple weeks ago, a couple months ago now, my wife and I, we celebrated our 20-year wedding anniversary, and my in-laws, my wife's aunt and uncle, gave us two bottles of vintage wine wine. It was two buck chuck, but it was from 2003. We haven't opened it yet, but there's something about vintage wine. Like the longer it keeps, you know, the better it is. Well, there's something about grace. The longer that we understand it, the longer that we soak and sit in it, it does something. It changes something in us. And I don't know if you guys have experienced that grace lately. I know for me, at times, I live kind of ignoring God's grace, knowing that it's there, but not experiencing it. I've, at times, often misunderstood grace and stripped it of its power. So let's just start off with a basic definition of grace. So grace, let's say it's not just a safety blanket, it's not just this awkward mercy, it's not just a license to sin. Grace is not an excuse to lead a spiritually mediocre life. Grace is also not just something in the past and just something in the future, not just something in the past that saves us and then something in the future that gets us to heaven. There's something about grace that empowers us today. Grace, I would say, is multifaceted. Some things I wrote down, that grace, it enables, it empowers, it strengthens, it fortifies, it gives us godlike power to walk, to speak, to think, to love, to react like we never thought possible. And so we should be seeing, we have the ability to see daily evidence of God's grace in our lives. And so what I wanna talk about today is the robust power of grace that God wants us to experience day in and day out. So you guys have been in Romans, right? Right, yep, okay. So. That's, a, that's an amazing book that's all about grace. The way it starts off in Romans chapter one, Paul says, this is why I'm eager to preach the gospel of grace, the gospel to you who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of this gospel because it is what? The power of God for salvation. So Paul, to the Romans, he's like, I'm so eager eager to tell you about this gospel because within it, within this message, is the power of God. Have you experienced that power? It's not just some spiritual thing, not just some religious thing, like it's actual power where you can see people transformed ridiculously. And so what I wanna do today is just digress from Romans and look at the book of Titus. Paul had this ambition to go to all these different places. Rome was one of them, where he wrote the letter to the Romans. But another one was in the book of Titus, he sent this dude named Titus to the island of Crete. Paul had this ambition to just keep spreading the gospel, this power of God. It says at the end of Romans, Paul says, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. And so 
We're gonna do, like, we're just gonna leave Rome today. You'll be back studying Romans next week, but we're gonna leave Rome today and we're gonna take a boat into the Mediterranean Sea and go to this cute little island called Crete where Paul left Titus. So if you have your Bibles or your phones, open your Bibles, go to Titus. It's near the end of the Bible. Titus chapter one. I'm just gonna read a few things and then I'll put it on the screen. Paul tells Titus this, this is why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So Paul leaves Titus on this island. He's like, hey, I need you to go town to town, appoint these elders and put things in order. So if he's saying that things need to be put in order, what does that probably mean? They're disorderly, They're, it's, 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 it's in chaos. Well, let's just look at how out of sorts this place was. Look at verse 10. And if you don't have your Bibles, just trust me. This is what it says. I'm not making this up. Verse 10, it says, there are many, this is the culture of Crete, there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers. All right, many who are insubordinate, like they don't care about authority. There are many who are empty talkers. They just talk about nonsense. They're deceivers. They're like out to mislead people. Look at verse 12. It says, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, says Cretans are always liars, always evil beasts, always lazy gluttons. Have you ever been like arguing with your kid or your spouse? You know, and they say, you always do this. And you're like, always, really? Or never, really, never, never do I do that? Like, The Bible's saying, Paul's saying, this testimony is true that Cretans are always liars. They're never saying anything true. They're evil beasts. They're not just evil humans. They're evil animal-like beasts. And they're lazy gluttons. They just sit around, do nothing but want to consume, take, take, take. Look at the last verse. It says, they, verse 16, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Okay, if I was Titus hearing this, I'd be like, I want out, next boat out. I want to go to a place that's easy. Can you imagine doing ministry in a place where people are insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, always liars, always evil beasts, always lazy gluttons, detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work? Right? Like, that's, that's intense. It's like, how in the world are those people so bad, so far gone, going to be changed? The power of a God, right? Now, I want you to think for a moment, before we just kind of push those people over there and think that we're nothing like them, like, we might identify with some of these people, right? You know, I'm, I, I can lie. I'm sometimes definitely not fit for good works. There's times where I'm definitely insubordinate, right? So let's, rather than just throwing them under the bus, it's like, okay, yeah, I, I, I was there, and I find myself there sometimes. So this is the place where Paul has left Titus. Now, Paul tells Titus, chapter 2, and I'll put it here on the screen, verse 1, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. As for you, unlike those people, as for you, I want you to teach what accords with sound doctrine. Now, I would think that what comes after this in chapter two would be a list of sound doctrine. Here's what I want you to teach about. Jesus, God the Father, and then God the Holy Spirit, and what I want you to teach about salvation and end times and sin and humanity. I would think that what was listed is, here is the sound doctrine that you need to teach. But instead, hang with me, Look what he does here. He describes the character of people. And I'm not going to read through it right now, but it says, older men, they're to be sober-minded, dignified. Verse three, older women are to be reverent in behavior. Younger women are to be self-controlled, pure. Verse six, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. Then jump down to verse 10. Not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So he's like, I want you to teach what accords with sound doctrine so that people don't just understand doctrine in their head, but that they love it and live it in their lives. Okay, who are these people in chapter two? These older men, older women, younger men, younger women, that are a model of good works, that are adorning the doctrine of God. Who are those people? 
They're the same people from chapter one. How in the world can people who are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work be these people that are a model for good works, self-controlled, upright, dignified, sound in speech and faith? How in the world can people go from there to here? The power of the gospel. Have you seen people change like that? Have you seen that in your life? As Paul goes on here, he tells us the secret sauce. He says, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this is how people are changed. Now, let's dive in here for a moment and look at each of these statements, each of these aspects of grace. The first thing it says, that the grace of God appeared bringing salvation. Have you seen people saved? My neighbor across the street, for the longest time, we would hang out, loved him, I love him. He's a prof- he was a professional soccer player, and so he would train my younger son in soccer, and I'd build a relationship with him, but he didn't want to really... He didn't really believe in God. He knew of Jesus from his background, being Catholic, but he just, he's like, it was just what we did. It was just what I was raised with. It was just what my parents were, but it wasn't anything more than that. I don't really want this Jesus, but I would share with him and talk with him. And then one day he texts me and he's like, I'm ready. And I'm like, ready for what? Like, what's going on? He's like, I'm ready to actually follow Jesus. I'm like, no way. And so we went out and I talked to him a little bit more about his relationship with Jesus and I shared the gospel with him again. I'm like, do you get it? Like, just think of Romans. You guys have been in Romans, right? Romans three, that all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. But because of the gift of God, you can be saved and there's no condemnation, Romans eight. But if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, Romans 10, and believe in your heart, you will be saved. I shared with him all that stuff, and I'm like, do you get it? Like, do you understand that? Is that, like, is that true to you? You know what he said to me? He's like, when I hear all of that, what God has done for me and who he thinks of me to be now, he's like, I'm just thankful. And I'm like, you get it. Like, you got it. Like, have you seen the grace of God appear bringing salvation for all people? You hear about everything that you guys as a church are doing to redeem this time at Christmas. There's so many people that this season isn't all jolly, but it's kind of like, reminds them of the past or the family that they don't have or the loved ones that they used to have, and it's sad, and you can bring hope and joy to people that are yet to believe. Like, the power of God can do that. All people. I don't know about you, but you guys have your uh, pray watch step list. Is that what it is? Pray watch step, right? Yes? <laughs> okay. Good. Good. You have people near the top of the list, maybe, that you're like, they're savable. Like, I think they'll get there. Like, I see them making movement. But then you got down here people that you're like, I'll pray for them because I know I need to, but I just don't think they're going to get saved. They're like, they're that neighbor that you want to build a taller fence with. They're that coworker that you want fired. Those people, all people, God can bring salvation to. That's pretty amazing. Anytime that my lack of faith comes out where I'm just like, oh, they will never change. Oh, they are just too far gone. It's almost like God just gently rebukes me. He's like, oh, really? Really? Let me, just, let me show you my power to transform people. Think about the Cretans. Think about the people on this island. Detestable, disobedient, always liars, evil beasts, lazy glass. Like, have you said that of anybody in your circle before? I mean, I have some people in my life that like, "Eh," but like, I've never described them with that much dark detail. And yet, Paul says to Titus, they can be older men and women, younger men and women that are a model of good works. You see, the gospel, the grace of God, has appeared to bring salvation for all people. I'm just telling you, like, trust what Drew is saying. Go out there, give the invites, share the gospel, let it rattle around in people's hearts, and watch the power of God at work. So, 
the grace of God has appeared to bring salvation, but it has also appeared to do something else. It says in verse 12, the grace of God appeared to bring salvation. The grace of God appeared also to train us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this, when? Present age, like today, like, like now. So this grace is not just something that saves us. It does, yes, but it also, this grace of God appeared to daily instruct us. It not only saved us, but it sanctifies us. It not only saves us, but it enables us. It trains us, as it says, to renounce and to live, to, to put off and to put on, to die to, to raise to. That is the pedagogy, that is the philosophy of grace is put off, put on. If you're like, you get saved and you're like, okay, what do I do? Where do I go? Like, how do I do this now? It's like, imagine showing up to the gym. And you guys have a gym membership? How many of you guys go? Okay, like, I start all the time. I just started again last week, okay? So if you have a gym membership, like, okay, you're saved, like, you, you got the gym membership, but you, you, you got to show up, right? Right, and then when you show up, have you ever seen those people in the gym? It's just like they're walking around, and it's like they get on the treadmill and they're just playing with it, and it's going up and down. They don't really know what to do, or they get on the machine like backwards, and you're like, no, 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 you go like this, not like that. Like, I feel like sometimes us as leaders and pastors were like, okay, you're saved, good, go live for God, and people are like, they're like people walking around the gym, like, what do I do? Like, what do I? Wh- Grace trains us. What grace does at its most basic level is it causes us to put on and put off, die to, raise to. It causes us, as this passage says, to say no and to say yes. Have you seen the grace of God do that in your life? Let's let's dive in just a little bit more. It causes us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. So like you read the scriptures and you're like, okay, I know I gotta do this. And then you're like, okay, so I gotta like put this stuff off, but I just, I can't. I just, I don't know if I want to. I just kind of want that stuff. The grace of God has appeared to cause you to renounce those things. You ever find yourself like knowing the good you ought to do, but you can't do it? Like that's God's department to step in to cause you to renounce those things. Like I can on good days, when I'm really Jesus-focused, maybe for a minute, a moment, in and of myself, by myself, live for God. But I find often, when I'm living for God, I'm still still wanting to do those things that my heart desires. Let's just camp there for a moment. You guys know there's things in your heart that you don't want anyone else to know, and you really do love them, and you wanna look, and you wanna think, and you wanna savor those things. And you're like, I've tried everything. I try to walk away and I just find myself walking back. And I try to live for God, but my mind is only thinking about those things. The grace of God has appeared to cause you not to want to want those things you used to want. It's like you just give it to God. You're like, God, I cannot change my affections. My affections want this. God can cause you to renounce those things. So just think of those things that for years, daily you've been thinking of, the grace of God can change that. The grace of God can change your affections so that you don't want those things anymore, but it does something else. It causes you to renounce those things, but it also causes you to want the things of God. So get this, the things that you always wanted, you don't, you're just like, I'm just not into that anymore. And the things that you never wanted, you begin to want the things of God. This rhythm, this training, this is when we show up each day to follow God, to seek God, this is what he's doing. He's causing us, he's working on us to change our affections. Like this is amazing. You know how amazing it was when you got saved? Like that same testimony of grace when you got saved, when you went from death to life, from blind to seen, like that 
same experience you can have each day where you're like, I want to want those things. No, God changed me, okay. And then he draws your heart to want different things. You experience the put off and the put on, the dying to and the raising to. That is the grace of God at work in your life. Now, here's some nasty, non-gospel, non-grace mindsets that I think of. Sometimes I think there seems to be no cure for these raging desires and passions within me. And if I gospel and grace myself, it's like, no, 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 no. I've been crucified to that sinful passion, all of it. No, 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 sin rules my life. I just have to do what it wants. No, 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 sin is dead. It is powerless. No, but like, I'm just entrenched. I'm just, we were just singing about it in a song. Like, I'm just wrapped up in these chains. No, those chains are broken. The same power, Romans 8, that you guys studied a couple months ago, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is alive in you. You guys get, this is not just Christian theory. Like, this is not just stuff that's on the pages of scripture. It literally says in that verse that we looked at that we get to adorn this. We get to wear this. We get to display this to others. When the gospel gets in our heart, it rattles around and it begins to change and transform us. Now, I wanna make this really practical, really practical, because you guys might be like, okay, I, I think I get what grace is, I want what grace is, I know I'm saved, but what is this whole training thing? How do I do that? How do I leave today? Because I wanna like have an experience of grace today and this week. The way not to do it is like this, and then I'll tell you the way to do it. The way not to do it is waking up tomorrow, knuckling down, in and of yourself, your own willpower, self-discipline, human resolve. That ain't gonna do it. That ain't gonna cut it. You're gonna make it till Wednesday before you quit. It's just not gonna work. Like, you guys know kinda like the ceiling of your obedience, right? You know what you're capable of, but then you read the scriptures, you're like, God calls me to more, but like, I just can't break that ceiling. So don't try in and of yourself. Also, I would say don't give up. Don't just think, you know what? I'm saved, I'm good, I got God. <laughs> you guys know here at Vintage, you talk about this joy, right? You're like, I want that joy. Well, the joy comes from doing what God's asked us to do. That's where the joy and the life and the love comes from. You're like, but I just, I can't, ah, I'm gonna give up. I just can't do it. Don't go there either. So here's a technique of grace that's helped me. Because I don't want you guys wandering around like those people in the gym, sitting backwards on machines, playing with the treadmill and not doing it. Like, here's a technique of grace that's worked for me. You look at God's word each day, because this is where life and hope is found, and you say, this is God's word, I must obey it. Like, this is God's word. That, like, I'm not gonna argue with you, God. I'm not gonna be like, whatever, God. No, no, this is God's word. Who am I to reply against God anything? Like, this is God's word. I must obey it. Yet in the same breath, I cannot obey it. You gotta go there. This is God's word. I'm not gonna argue with this God. It says like, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, like, put to death, flee from sexual immorality. Okay, I'm not gonna argue with that. Okay, God, but I can't do that. You know me. I, I, I cannot do that. But Jesus did, and through the grace of Jesus, I can. So just think of it like this. This is God's word I must obey. Number two, I cannot obey. Number three, Jesus did obey. Number four, by the grace of God, I can obey. If you approach God's word like that, coming to the end of yourself, how did you guys get saved? When you guys got saved, you're like, okay, I've tried everything else, it hasn't worked out. I'm, at, I'm in the pit, I'm at the bottom. That's when God saved you. Well, how do you live for God each day? You start at the bottom. You start at the end of yourself. You're like, God, I am nothing without you, but with you, I can live a forgiven, accepted life. I can live the way you've called me to. So you start with God's word. You're like, God, I wanna hear from you. This is your word. I must obey it. Number two, I cannot obey it. There's no way I can live this out. Yet Jesus did. He is my hero. He is my example. And by the grace of God, I can live like him. If you, if you change the rhythm of your life, change your posture, you're gonna begin to see grace train you to put off and to put on. But there's more to grace. Look where it heads. 
It says the grace of God appeared to us to save us. It appeared to us to train us to say no and to say yes. And then verse 13, the grace of God appeared, causing us to wait for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace has appeared to give us hope. So you guys know you studied the book of Revelation, right? And it's all about Jesus winning and that everything at the end, Jesus is gonna bring to resolve and all of his promises are true. Sometimes we think of this future reality with Jesus as it's just, yeah, it's theory, it's far off. Yeah, I know it's true, but how does that thing in the future impact me today? The grace of Jesus can cause you to have joy now with what's coming later. Think of it like this. Last month, at the beginning of October, it was just, it was sucky. Like, I was dealing with some things at the church, dealing with some other stuff just internally at times. I just go to a dark place in my head. And I was just sad and mad and frustrated. I was just kind of in a mood I couldn't get out of. But that upcoming Wednesday, I was going to Kauai with my wife to celebrate our 20-year anniversary. And so although the beginning of October sucked. It was terrible. I knew that I was gonna be on a plane on Wednesday going to Kauai. And so the reality of going to Kauai with my wife began to change and shift my mood today. Or think of it, you kids in the audience. Say you're having a, a terrible week. School, issue with friends, not doing well with your grades. What if your parents told you, you know, this weekend we are going to Disneyland. We're going to Disneyland to see Mickey Mouse. Like, and they start getting excited. Yes, today, this is a hard week, yeah, but Saturday, we are gonna be in the happiest place on earth with the longest lines on earth. It's gonna be amazing. You guys see how that changes. Sometimes just the thought of a football game like this afternoon, you're like, dude, it's awesome. Or thinking about us, our warriors, how well they're doing and the Kings not so much. Like, like I get excited about things like that, even though like right now it's like, oh, but then I think of this. You realize that the grace of God can change us to give us joy now in the reality of the glory of Jesus appearing. What am I getting at? God has given us a grace that he wants us to just keep reaching for. And sometimes we, we just pull out grace only when we want somebody to get saved or just to teach them about Jesus. But there's a grace that God wants to give us day in and day out to train us to say no and to say yes, and also a grace to give us hope. Now look how the passage wraps up. Speaking of Jesus, it says, Jesus who gave himself for us to redeem us from how much? All lawlessness and to purify himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Okay, notice what it says at the end there. Zealous for good works. These people, these same people, it says at the end of chapter one that they are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work are the same people who are gonna be zealous for good works. How does that happen? Jesus. Jesus redeems us from all lawlessness. Not just some, not just a few things, all of it. So again, think of your deepest, darkest secret. Think about those things that you're just like, I will always be defined and confined and chained by this thing. No, 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 no. That is a lie. Jesus gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify you, purify us as a people for his own possession. So what do we do with this? Where do we go with this? Look at the last verse. This is the responsibility I wanna put on you guys as we wrap up today. Declare these things. Exhort, rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. So everything that I've talked about so far today is everything Jesus has done. You don't have to save yourself. Just trust in that. Like, you, you can't. You can try, but you won't. Jesus does that. You can try to put off and put on. You can try to give up those things that you're attracted to and begin to live for God. Like, you can try, but no. The grace of God appeared to train you to say no to those things and to say yes to the things of God. 
Jesus is the only one that can do that. So what do we do? What do we do with a message of grace like this? We declare it, we exhort others in it, we rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. Get this, I do this all the time with people. I was on a walk with this dude last week, 70 year old man, he was telling me he's in this dark, dark, dark spot where he's just depressed, he said sadness doesn't even begin to describe what he's feeling. And I rebuked him. I, I, I said, this is not who you are. Like, this is who God is for you. This is what God wants for you. You realize the, the idea of rebuke it doesn't have to be negative. Like, hey, you're a sinner. Suck it up. Stop sucking. It, it's like, that's not rebuke. I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't think God is against you. Don't think that God doesn't want to have you. No, no, no. God loves you. He enjoys you. He's for you. That's rebuking somebody with truth, exhorting them in the truth of the gospel. It, to, and then it says, let no one disregard you. My oldest son, he has some of the same struggles as I do, and he gets in these weird negative narratives where he just spirals. He's a senior in high school. And so we go walks. We go on these walks around our cul-de-sac. And there's times where he tells me what he's thinking. I'm like, no, 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 no. Seth, Seth. God delights in you, and that sin is not you. You are a saint by grace. You are cleansed. You are loved I'm telling him about this Jesus that he believes in. That is what we as a church get to do to each other. When we sing about it, we're hearing about this grace. We're about ready to go into a song called Living Hope. And if you don't believe what we're singing, just begin to listen to everybody talking about this grace, this living hope that we have in Jesus. This is what we are called to do with one another, is share with one another about the truth of grace, and when we find ourselves not believing it, go to other people, say, remind me, remind me who I am. That might sound weird, but like, do it. Like, I do this with my wife all the time where she has to tell me, no, 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 that is not who you are. I do this with my son, no, 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 that is not who you are. You may even need to take it a step further and have like these battle verses. I was telling my buddy last week, I'm like, you need to get some verses that you write down so you wake up in the morning and all that garbage that you're thinking of initially, like read the truth of scripture. God loves me, he's for me. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And all these passions and desires I am dead to and I get to live for God. Like you need to start a new narrative, a narrative of grace to train you to believe what God says is true of you. I'm telling you, here at Vintage, your goal, your mission is to have a joy-filled community. How do you get there? Is it just by smiling at one another? No. It's about reminding each other of the joy that we have, the life that we have, the promises of grace that we have because of the work of Jesus. So let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you are good to us, and we thank you that you've given us Jesus. We thank you that we have hope, Father. Father, I pray for any of us here that are stuck in sin, any of us that just feel lost, any of us, Father, that just feel too far gone, Father, I pray for hope for those people. Lord, and I pray right now for those of us that are doing well right now, and we're like, we're thinking we're good. I pray that you'd put on our minds right now another believer either at this church or someone else that we can reach out to, that we can encourage, that we can encourage with the truth of grace. Father, help us not to remain silent. Father, as Paul said, he was eager to share the gospel, the good news of grace with the Romans. Help us here in EDH, in Sacramento, in our workplaces, on the ball fields. Father, help us to be eager to share about the gospel, the good news of grace, because we know it is, it has within it your power. We thank you, Father, for loving us and being for us. We thank you that you like us, that you enjoy us. We thank you that you are not against us. We pray these things in Jesus' name.
Church, let us stand and respond together as we sing. our firm foundation and just like what Matt was saying earlier we have this grace 
that empowers us, this grace that covers us. And it's that grace that God has given us that we get to carry with us into everywhere that we go this week. Remember that you are sent to be the living proof of our loving God to the place of work, to your place where you play, the place where you learn, to your family. You're going there to be the living proof of our loving God. We love you guys. We'll see you next week.